Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My thanks to the Nobel Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, the Potsdam Institute, the Stockholm Resilience Center, and the Bayer Institute for bringing us together for this first ever Nobel Prize Summit, Our Planet, Our Future. My colleagues have eloquently articulated the compelling need to harness knowledge, accelerate awareness, and transform practices and policies that will enable a transition to a sustainable and resilient future. They make the case that our future is intimately tied to the natural world, that solutions to major crises facing humanity are possible, but only if we become better stewards of nature, of the living planet, and of each other. In listening to them, I was reminded of the words of the population geneticist Theodosius Dobzhansky, who said, quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, unquote. With apologies to, to Dobzhansky, my colleagues' remarks might be partly captured with the words, nothing in the future makes sense or is even possible without nature. I'm also reminded of John W. Gardner's words that, quote, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as insoluble problems, unquote. And make no mistake, the challenges facing us are real. They are daunting, but as you have heard, they are not insurmountable. I'm here today to tell you that the ocean not only encapsulates all of these problems, and opportunities, it also offers common ground and opportunity for people to solve seemingly intractable problems and co-create a vibrant shared future. The ocean is a central player in our biosphere, in our lives, and in our future, even though for most people it is out of sight, out of mind. The ocean is not only our past, but I believe it is our future. It feeds and sustains us, it connects us. Since time immemorial, the ocean has been the grocery store, the pharmacy, the playground, and the highway for people around the world. The ocean regulates our climate and produces our weather. It is the lifeblood and the identity of diverse cultures. The ocean is also an unfathomable library, most of whose books we cannot yet read, but which surely contain treasures of undiscovered knowledge. And the ocean is a source of inspiration as well as knowledge. One of Chile's Nobel laureates in literature, Pablo Neruda, whose poems and coastal residents are infused with oceanic influences wrote, Necesito del mar porque me enseña. I need the sea because it teaches me. And halfway around the world from South Africa, the film My Octopus Teacher, which just two days ago won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Film Feature, provides additional insights and inspiration. In short, the ocean feeds our bodies, our spirits, and our minds. But the living ocean is at risk, and therefore so are we. Through ignorance and arrogance, we have squandered the beauty and the bounty of the ocean, undermined the ability of ocean ecosystems to provide the life support systems that we need and want. Moreover, they have introduced significant inequities that disproportionately play out to the poor and most vulnerable people around the world. Especially over the last half century, the ocean has been depleted and disrupted with devastating consequences to many people. Climate change and ocean acidification, habitat destruction, overfishing and destructive fishing gear, mining, oil and gas exploration and extraction, nutrient, toxin, and plastic pollution from the land all take their toll. 
The 2019 IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and the Cryosphere documents in frankly depressing detail the massive impacts of climate change and its equally evil twin ocean acidification on the ocean. The ocean is now warmer, more acidic, less productive, and less predictable. These impacts are devastating on multiple fronts. For many fisheries in the developed and developing worlds alike, with consequences to health, economies, and opportunities for development. For entire ecosystems like coral reefs, kelp forests, and mangrove forests that are home to rich biodiversity, support lives and livelihoods through fisheries and tourism, protect coastal communities from storm surge and coastal erosion, and capture or store vast amounts of carbon. Unfortunately, this doomy portrayal is all too real. But as daunting as the challenges are, the problems are not insurmountable. We know that ocean ecosystems can be resilient and can recover if stressors are removed soon enough. We know that people who depend upon the ocean can be resilient. For example, we have seen depleted fisheries recover following implementation of fishery reforms. We have seen depleted and disrupted ocean habitats recover following implementation of marine protected areas or MPAs that are fully and highly protected. In both instances, science-based policies that were deployed using the right incentives and the necessary enabling conditions provided the secret sauce for success. In truth, there are thousands of great efforts underway to recover the bounty of the ocean and to use it wisely. We have solutions. They are powerful. But those efforts, those solutions are not at the scale or pace that is needed, and certainly not that is commensurate with the magnitude of the challenges. New science, new awareness, and new solutions are emerging. They're bubbling up all over the world from civil society, from industry, financial and governmental sectors. And this is painting a picture of opportunity and hope. Novel partnerships, for example, are demonstrating the power of taking a holistic, integrated nature society approach, combining perspectives and co-creating solutions. Here are three quick examples. The 14 heads of state and government that came together as the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, representing 30% of the world's EEZs and 20% of fisheries and 20% of shipping, are actively pursuing the triple bottom line win of protect effectively, produce sustainably, and prosper equitably. The three together protect effectively, produce sustainably, and prosper equitably. The 10 CEOs of some of the world's largest seafood companies have formed a unique partnership with scientists and industry leaders called CBOS to chart a course towards sustainable and climate smart fisheries and aquaculture. The Friends of Ocean and Climate Nations last week convened a side event just prior to President Biden's Climate Leaders Summit to draw attention to the opportunities for the ocean to contribute significantly to the achievement of the net zero goal. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate John Kerry, Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm, Hawaii's Governor David Ige joined nine presidents, prime ministers, and ministers from around the globe to announce significant commitments to tap the potential of ocean-based solutions to mitigate climate change. The commitments they announced echoed the findings from a scientific report commissioned by the Ocean Panel that concluded that ocean-based activities could contribute as much as 21%, one-fifth of the greenhouse gas emission reductions that are needed to get us to the 1.5 degree target by 2050. Those activities include ocean renewable energy, decarbonizing shipping, protecting and restoring blue carbon ecosystems, the salt marshes, mangroves, seagrass beds, 
and more. Clearly, the ocean can play a central role in addressing the climate crisis. It has not really been a go-to place for mitigation. It needs to be, it can be, it should be. In similar fashion, the ocean is central to addressing the food security crisis. Currently about 3 billion people depend on seafood as a significant source of protein. A recent scientific paper in Nature by Costello et al. estimated that if managed properly, the ocean could produce up to six times more sustainable seafood than it does today by 2050. And new analyses are suggesting that the biodiversity crisis can be tackled in ways that facilitate simultaneous achievement of climate and food security goals. A recent paper in Nature by Sala et al presents an innovative approach to use fully and highly protected MPAs to achieve three simultaneous goals of biodiversity protection, carbon storage to help with the climate crisis, and food provisioning. Imagine being able to incorporate the carbon stored in MPAs as part of a country's NDCs. So new science and new partnerships are driving new awareness and action. Novel partnerships are creating opportunities with co-benefits across multiple dimensions of simultaneous crises confronting humanity. And we are seeing increasingly how central the ocean is to our future. In short, the ocean encapsulates the broader planetary challenges and it offers solutions and hope. As a consequence, we're seeing a new narrative about the ocean emerge. The evolution of narratives about the ocean are reflective of a broader evolution of our thinking about planetary challenges and our role. I believe that narratives are important because they reflect and help shape our thinking and our action. So the ocean narrative that has existed for pretty much as long as people have been on the planet is that the ocean is so immense, it's so bountiful, it's so resilient, it would be impossible to deplete or disrupt it. This was the narrative that people had about the ocean for thousands and thousands of years. The ocean was thought to be so vast, it was thought to be too big to fail. This mindset persists today and drives even greater and more intense exploitation and unsustainable uses that reflect ignorance, the allure of new economic opportunity, failed uh, failures to incorporate the kind of economic valuation approaches of nature that Professor Dasgupta just alluded to, or the urgent need for resources. But we are also seeing graphic evidence of the folly of this not too big to, of this too big to fail narrative in the news about collapsed fisheries, bleached coral reefs, hungry people, images of plastic pollution. But when people ponder this evidence, this overwhelming bad stuff that's happening in the ocean, all too often they become quickly overwhelmed and depressed. A doom and gloom mindset takes over. We see a similar phenomenon with climate change. The problems can appear too complex, the vested interests too powerful, system inertia seems too great. And so a second narrative about the ocean has emerged recently. This narrative says that the ocean is massively and fatally depleted and disrupted. The ocean is too big to fix. That narrative can easily lead to depression, lack of engagement, with no motivation to help address the problems. However, despite the undeniable challenges, and not surprisingly, given what I said earlier, there are hints of a new mindset emerging. A new third narrative is building on the powerful solutions that already exist. 
and would seek to replicate, accelerate, and escalate these solutions for greater progress. And it could stimulate and needs to stimulate the creation of additional solutions based on greater efficiency, more appropriate incentives, better accounting, new technological and biotech solutions, and regenerative holistic approaches like my colleagues have been talking about. For those innovations to succeed, they must take a holistic approach, reflecting the need to consider earth system science through the lens of this coupled human natural systems. In this fashion, we seek solutions that bring co-benefits to poverty, hunger, economic development, that address inequity, but also focus on peace and security, and that pay close attention to coastal resilience and adaptation going forward. I believe that the new emerging narrative could be quite powerful. I understand that a new narrative does not automatically change the status quo, but it can reset our expectations and liberate, inspire ingenuity. This new narrative acknowledges that the ocean is so central to our future, it's too important to neglect. It notes the opportunities for ocean-based solutions to mitigate and adapt to climate change. It notes the opportunities for sustainable fisheries and aquaculture to significantly contribute to food security. And it shines a spotlight on ways to protect biodiversity while simultaneously simultaneously contributing to food provisioning and meeting the climate crisis. In short, we are seeing the emergence of a new narrative for the ocean. The ocean is indeed our past, but it is also key to the future. The nature society connections in the ocean are clear. A new narrative that embraces the inherent complexity of the nature society complex adaptive systems is urgently needed. People are inextricably linked and ultimately dependent upon the ocean. In short, it is in our own interest as well as our responsibility to be good stewards of the ocean. The ocean is not too big to fail, nor is it too big to fix but it is too central and too important to ignore. So in healing the ocean, we can heal ourselves. Time is wasting, dive in. Thank you. <laughs>